We've already taken a look at the properties that make a quadrilateral or a parallelogram a rhombus rectangular square. In this lesson, we're going to be taking a look at the opposite. What conditions exist that justify these different shapes? So we're going to begin with three theorems. The first is theorem 616, which tells us if the diagonals of a parallelogram are perpendicular, then the parallelogram is a rhombus. So this is basically the converse of a theorem we had in our last lesson. Theorem 617 also is a converse. It states, if one diagonal of a parallelogram bisects a pair of opposite angles, then the parallelogram is a rhombus. So also bear in mind that any qualification for a rhombus are also a requirement for a square. And same will go true with any qualifications for a rectangle. Squares will meet that as well. Now, squares actually meet the junction of these two concepts. Our last theorem for this unit, now this lesson, is theorem 618, and it tells us if the diagonals of a parallelogram are congruent, then the parallelogram is a rectangle. So with these theorems, coupled together with the things that we saw in our previous lesson, what can we do with them? How can we start justifying the existence of these different shapes? Let's take a look at one example. So here we have a shape and we're given two of the half diagonals or semi-diagonals. What we need to know is what value for the variable y would make it so that this actually is a rectangle and not some other parallelogram. And with the theorems that we have, this will be a rectangle only when those diagonals are congruent to each other. If the diagonals are congruent, then these segments will be congruent as well. So we will have the situation where 5y plus 3 is equal to 7y minus 5. Now, using our properties of equality, subtraction property of equality says I can subtract 5y from each side and maintain the balance of the equation. So 3 is equal to 2y minus 5. Addition property of equality says that I can add 5 to each side. Tell me that 8 is equal to 2y. And division property of equality tells me I can divide both sides of this by 2, leaving me with 4 being equal to y. Meaning that if we were to substitute this back in, 7 times 4 minus 5, it gives us 23, or 5 times 4 plus 3 also gives us 23. So these diagonals, these segments of the diagonals are congruent at 23. The other halves would be 23 also, making the diagonals 46 in total. So this is good for being able to calculate individual items, but what about looking at a method of application for such an idea? Well, I have a little bit of this in, I used to work in construction and company I was working for was building a new truck. And what we did was we took the existing truck structure, which had the cab and a short bed on it, and we welded on a set of extensions in order to elongate that bed and make it so we could turn it into a dump truck. So from a top perspective, we had the cab and we had to put on these two rails. How can we justify that we had actually created a rectangle or that the rails were parallel to each other and of the same length? What my boss ended up doing was he took a string and held it from right behind the cab to the end of the rail on the opposite side, marked where that was, and then d repeated it from the other side and kept doing this until the string measured the same in both directions. Once he had that, he knew that these diagonals would be congruent to one another, and if those diagonals are congruent to one another, then he was guaranteed to have a rectangular shape for the bed. So a lot of ways of being able to use this. You can make sure that things meet at a right angle in the center at this intersection and they're the same length. That would give you a square. And all the different properties that we've looked at. So some mild application to go along with the rest of these concepts.
Make sure you have these concepts down and are ready to use the theorems and apply them as we move forward into other parts of geometry.